Hey everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today, I'm joined in by a very special guest, somebody that I've looked up to for many years now, um, and what I believe is an absolute pioneer um, in his field, and that is Dr. James De Nicolantonio. So, James, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Lucas. Awesome. So I guess we'll sort of start out by um, giving my listeners a bit of an insight into your journey, into where you are today. Sure. Yeah. And so my journey started as a community pharmacist and really I got interested in salt because a lot of my patients, the first thing their doctors would do if they would go into the office and they had high blood pressure was put them on low salt diets and they felt terrible. And, or they would put them on like a, a diuretic to lower their blood pressure. And they would come to me and they would say, is my diuretic supposed to be causing all these symptoms like dizziness? And I don't feel like um, I have the energy to even get out of bed. Um, and my doctor put me on this low salt diet. And I was like, you know, salt is an essential mineral. You know, you may be too depleted in salt. You should go back to your doctor, test your sodium levels, see if you're dehydrated. And a lot of times those people were, and they instantly felt better when they started consuming more salt. And so that sort of spun off the book and why I wanted to do research in that area because it it was impacting my patients in a negative way. And then my journey into my own personal health sort of took a turn when I was 26, I was bench pressing by myself and I partially tore my pectoralis tendon. And so I I could no longer just kind of lift and eat whatever I wanted. I couldn't lift heavy anymore. So I had to really figure out how to eat a healthy diet so I wouldn't put on weight because I could no longer sort of exercise my way out of it. It's very interesting, man. So I guess for majority of people, they've been told like salt is something we need to avoid to, and, and they focus primarily on the link between salt and blood pressure. And that seems to be the only sort of correlation and the hyper focus, but I guess we should probably start out by explaining to our listeners why salt is so much more than simply just regulating blood pressure. What, what else does it, what are, what are some of the other key functions in the body? Yeah. So for, for those who don't know what salt is chemically composed of, it's composed of two essential minerals, sodium and chloride. And sodium helps control fluid balance. And it actually, we need a blood pressure, believe it or not, to live. And so having a blood pressure isn't bad. It's just having a very elevated blood pressure, which is typically associated with plaque in the arteries or renal artery stenosis or having high aldosterone levels and not necessarily high salt intake or having insulin resistance. And sodium is also a preservative and it helps us eat more nutritious food because it brings flavor. So you don't have to use as much sugar. Now, chloride is also an important mineral. It's used, we ingest chloride, we can't make it. So both of sodium and chloride are essential. We can't make it, we have to get it from the diet. And chloride makes up hydrochloric acid. So it makes up stomach acid. So if you wanna be able to digest food, kill bacteria, viruses, and extract nutrients from your food, you need good acid and clinical studies have shown when you cut your salt intake, your stomach acid goes down. And so that can sort of reduce, that could cause digestive issues, uh, nutritional deficiencies, simply from a digestive standpoint. And then you can get overgrowth of yeast, mold, bacteria, viruses, if you don't have good stomach acid. Now our immune system actually uses chloride for hypochlorous acid to kill invading microbes. So chloride has a very important role in regards to antimicrobial benefits from stomach acid to also being utilized by our own immune system. And then sodium um, is very important with glucose transport to get glucose into the cell um, and actually transporting many nutrients. So vitamin C, how we absorb it and how we drive vitamin C into the cell is through two sodium ions. So again, these are essential nutrients, not, not basically a poison that we've been led to believe. Mm. Yeah. I find that so fascinating how like, um, you know, majority of the people, they just neglect 
all the other aspects of a fundamental electrolyte. Um, and and the one point you mentioned was like, you know, you, you discussed like how salt is actually required to get glucose into the cell. Um, and there's a lot of people discussing, um, you know, the implications of a high salt diet on uh, insulin resistance. So maybe do you want to like, dispel some of the myths around a high salt diet contributing to insulin resistance? Yeah, so there's at least 16 human clinical studies that have shown that a low salt diet causes insulin resistance, elevated fasting insulin levels, and an increase in the oral glucose tolerance test. And the reason is because salt is an essential mineral and our body has developed a mechanism to retain more sodium and that's by elevating insulin levels so the kidneys can retain more salt. And that's exactly what happens if you cut your salt intake, the body can slowly become insulin resistant to hold on to more salt. Whereas if you just eat a normal salt diet, you can drop the insulin levels and fix insulin resistance. And like you said, the hyper focus on blood pressure, yes, if you look at 80% of people with normal blood pressure are not salt sensitive. Even 75% of people with prehypertension aren't salt sensitive. It's really people who have high blood pressure where about one in two are actually salt sensitive, but they're salt sensitive primarily because they're insulin resistant. And if you cut the refined carbs and sugar and drop the high insulin levels, you can fix the salt sensitivity. So we sort of blame the wrong way crystal, we blame salt when it's really sugar that's driving the problems of high blood pressure and, and atherosclerosis and heart disease. Yeah. So with insulin itself, what sort of role does it play in um, retaining salt? Like somebody, somebody who has elevated insulin, how does that contribute to retaining salt or influencing blood pressure? Yeah, so primarily in the kidneys, insulin will cause more sodium to be reabsorbed, even if you don't need it. And so you will accumulate actually more salt and fluid when you are eating a high refined carb and sugar diet. And same thing goes with when you have elevated glucose levels, um, you actually retain more water. So it's really not salt that's causing fluid retention. It's actually elevated levels of glucose. And... Um, that pulls water into the arteries, the elevated levels of glucose, and it also elevates insulin, causing you to retain sodium. So it's really what's been pinned on, again, salt for causing fluid retention is actually due to sugar. And there's a secondary role that sugar plays in salt retention, and, and that is it causes magnesium deficiency. So if you eat diets that are high in sugar, you kick out more magnesium in the urine because it elevates insulin levels and you can't get magnesium into the cell. And magnesium deficiency actually causes your vessels to become more leaky and causes more edema and fluid retention. So sugar, by driving insulin levels up, by causing magnesium to go down, and by elevating insulin, it's causing this whole salt and fluid retention. I find that super fascinating. Um, so I know that salt's obviously like, you know, it's discussed quite a lot in the whole athletic performance realm. And I mean, I've got like a, a soccer background and I personally, you know, lift weights five days a week and I'm smashing as much salt as I can around my workouts. Um, and personally, I have like on my blood tests, like my sodium levels are always slightly low, like they're on the lower end of the scale. I mean, and we know there's a lot of um, adrenal hormones um, and mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids that can influence um, sodium retention, but let's sort of discuss now how um, salt can influence uh, our adrenal function because I, I know a lot of people are struggling with like adrenal fatigue, which you know we, we know doesn't exist. Um, but how how does salt actually influence like the HPA axis? So the closest. Um I guess, mechanism we can associate adrenal fatigue to is hypertrophy of the adrenal glands. And we can see that in animal studies. So if you put animals on a low salt diet, what will happen is they will start producing about 10 times the amount of aldosterone. And that is coming out of the adrenal glands. And what will eventually end up happening is the adrenal glands will hypertrophy 
due to the stress of constantly cranking out so much aldosterone to retain salt when they're put on a low salt diet. And that can lead to adrenal fatigue or burnout. So when you say adrenal fatigue or you say pancreatic beta cell fatigue, typically what happens first is hypertrophy of the organ and then dysfunction. And the hypertrophy is because it's overcompensating and overworking for a stressful situation. So low salt diets can absolutely cause adrenal fatigue in animal studies. We can't, you know, they haven't uh, looked at the adrenal glands in humans, but I would assume similar things would happen because the aldosterone response is very similar in humans as it is to animals. You get that three to tenfold increase in aldosterone um, and nor, uh, noradrenaline with low salt diets. So it's a stressful situation, not only on the adrenal glands, but on the kidneys because the kidneys have to filter over three pounds of salt and then reabsorb all basically virtually 99.9% .9 of all that salt. The more salt you consume though, exogenously, the kidneys don't have to actively reabsorb as much. And it is a tremendous expenditure on ATP. It's 60% of the kidneys energy all day is simply reabsorbing the salt it filters. So salt is not stressful on the kidneys. It's actually um, a relief on the kidneys. Wow. Um, so you also mentioned uh, how like a low salt diet can cause, well, for, for organ failure and organ um, efficiency, you said first they hypertrophy. So I want to sort of um, delve into how a low salt diet can affect the heart specifically. Like how does it influence the heart's function itself? So Sodium, um, when you go on a low salt diet, when it, what ends up happening is your blood volume goes down. So yes, you can, you do see, sometimes see a reduction in blood pressure, but it's not a good reduction in blood pressure. You're just dehydrating the person. So if I put you on a low water diet, okay, I could lower your blood pressure. Why? But we would never think that's healthy because we think everyone knows that water is healthy. We need to start looking at salt very similarly because salt is an essential mineral. So you start stressing out the body when you go on a low salt diet and the heart, because now the heart has to pump faster. And so what ends up happening is almost everyone on a low salt diet will have an elevation in their heart rate to anywhere from four to 15 beats per minute quicker. So when you add in blood pressure and you multiply that by heart rate, that equals the stress on the heart. And almost everybody has an increase in the heart rate multiplied by the blood pressure when you go on a low salt diet. Now for most people too, the, you get insulin resistance in the blood vessels. So your blood vessels actually are more constrictive when they have less salt because your blood volume drops. So your blood vessels want to constrict to maintain blood pressure. So now your heart's pumping against a more constricted blood vessel. Uh, and so this is, happens if you have adequate intakes of potassium and you drop your salt intake, that's a problem. If you have adequate intakes of potassium and you have a normal salt diet, everything works how it's supposed to work. Mm. And if somebody did um, focus too much on potassium and they sort of neglect the sodium side, they reach sort of hyperkalemia and things like that, what sort of implications is that going to have on, I guess, energy and how somebody's going to feel like? On a low salt diet, like what are some of the symptoms that somebody might experience um, on a low salt diet? The most common symptoms on a low salt diet is fatigue, uh, dizziness going from a seated to a standing position, exercise intolerance, erectile dysfunction because blood flow is dramatically reduced on a low salt diet, um, and uh, cramping too, muscle spasms, muscle cramps, headaches, so I can't tell you a ton of people in the summer tell me that when they up their salt intake, their migraines or their headaches are dramatically reduced. And there's an interplay with salt and magnesium where if you're not getting enough salt, the body will start pulling sodium, but also magnesium and calcium from the bone to maintain a normal blood sodium level. And when that happens and you pull magnesium from the bone when you're not getting enough salt, it spikes the blood level of magnesium and the body thinks it's overloaded and it stops, it reduces the absorption of magnesium and starts kicking more out. So there's a huge interplay at the very top is salt. Sodium controls magnesium. 
If you don't get enough sodium, you flush out magnesium from the bone and then everything falls out after that because magnesium controls potassium and calcium via the sodium potassium ATPase. So I, I call salt the master controller of all the minerals because if you're not getting enough, you induce magnesium deficiency and then potassium and calcium fall from there. Unbelievable. Um, so I want to sort of circle back to um, the athletic performance realm because that's obviously an area that I love and you know, I've got clients that are obsessed with training and things like that. So, you know, you mentioned the fact that a low sodium diet um, is going to put more strain on the heart and influence, I guess, like the stroke volume and cardiac output. So maybe um, do you want to delve into how sodium can be a performance enhancer um, in regards to like maybe sweating and things like that? Yeah. So basically uh, when you exercise, the blood is now being shunted to working muscle. So in the artery, the blood volume goes down by about 10% when you're exercising. So if you can boost your blood volume by 10% before you work out, you're going to prevent the drop in blood volume by about 10%, which is why most people can't perform well in the heat is because there's such a dramatic drop in blood volume. And the second point that you brought up is that we do lose about a half a teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise in the heat. Um, if it's about 80 degrees or higher at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, we typically lose about a full teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise particularly soccer players because they're so active. Um, soccer players can lose up to two and a half teaspoons of salt every single hour in their sweat. And it doesn't seem to go down because the most vital function that the body will try to fight is an elevation in core body temperature. Because if you go too high, you end up obviously potentially dying or heat stroke. So the body will keep pushing out salt and fluids to prevent heat stroke. And so that's why there is a continuous loss, even out to eight hours of salt and fluid to cool us off. So salt is very important. What the studies show is if you take a full teaspoon of salt with about 20 to 24 ounces of fluid, and you slowly start consuming that 90 to 105 minutes prior to exercise, and you slowly consume it over 60 minutes, you boost blood volume, and you can exercise about 21 minutes longer in the heat. There's nothing, there's no supplement on the market that even comes close to that. I mean, beta alanine might give you an extra minute. Salt, just salt and fluid gives you an extra 21 minutes. If people knew this, I think um, there would be a lot more world records being broke in the Olympics and things like that if people actually knew how to dose with salt and fluid. Yeah. Um and then, you're, well, most of them would be focused so heavily on the creatine. And part of the ergogenic effects of creatine is that water retention. Um, I'm not mm. sure if that's extracellular or intracellular. Um, but let's sort of discuss a little bit about, because um, I know a lot of people are focusing on their HRV readings, um, heart rate variability for those listening in. Um, and I had a question from a friend of mine who, who sort of wanted to know a little bit about how potentially whether there's like a link between um, a low salt, a low blood sodium level and a HRV and a, and a correlation between um, an altered HRV reading. Is there any research in that realm? So I, there is a little bit of research if I recall. And from what I understand, heart rate variability, I think you want to have a higher heart rate variability, correct? Yeah. And I think um, as you see heart rate variability go down, the risk of cardiovascular events dramatically increases. It's actually one of the best surrogate markers. I think people who have a high heart rate variability versus a low heart rate variability have about a tenfold increased risk in a cardiovascular event. And again, if you fix insulin sensitivity and you're not over retaining salt, um, the studies that I recall, I, I think there was just one and don't quote me on this, but that it improved heart rate variability. Mm. So, um, again, we do have to look at more than just blood pressure. We want to look at all these other surrogate markers. And that's, that's really what I try to focus on in the book is, yeah, if you look at blood pressure itself, salt in people with high blood pressure may seem harmful, but then when you start looking at aldosterone, noradrenaline, 
renin, the stress hormones, and you look at heart rate, and you look at cholesterol, triglycerides, insulin resistance, they're all worsened on a low salt diet. And then heart rate variability is worsened on a low salt diet. So when you start adding in all these things, it clearly is now tipping in salt's favor. Yeah. So what about a little bit um, from a clinical perspective and some of the research, uh, some of the clinical trials that they've run um, using um, maximum threshold dosages of salt intake. So I want to know a little bit more about um, what are some of the doses that they've used like clinically to test people's responses to salt? Are we talking like two teaspoons, three teaspoons, four teaspoons, What's out there? So, um, so for salt, they've actually gone up in some studies up to close to 60 to 100 grams of salt. In, and in people with normal blood pressure, it doesn't even move the needle. Um, again, because we're, we, can, uh, we filter over three pounds of salt every single day, we filter a teaspoon of salt via the kidneys every five minutes. So consuming a teaspoon of salt is honestly a joke from a biological perspective because we're basically these salt filtering machines. And um, if we're filtering a full teaspoon of salt every five minutes, to think that one teaspoon or two teaspoons of salt per day is a lot is not, especially when we can lose that much in just an hour of exercise. So um, the clinical studies that have ever shown really large increases in blood pressure um, always are on a background diet that's not healthy. So these people aren't eating real food and a normal salt diet. They're eating crappy processed food. And then they add a lot of salt, like two to three times as much as normal. And it's typically in people who aren't eating a lot of potassium. Because as soon as you look at the clinical trials where people are consuming a good amount of potassium and they're eating whole foods, then the blood pressure um, does not waver with salt intake variation of tenfold. That's interesting. Um so what about like, is there sort of like a correlation between, um, cause I know I've personally seen my sodium often match the chloride value on a blood test. Um, and so I want to discuss a little bit about chloride cause I feel like that's sort of, that gets neglected a little bit. Um, and no one really discusses that, but what are some of the, um, some of the key functions of chloride, um, in, in, in the human body? Yeah, so basically with sodium and chloride, um, it's very important in heart failure patients, a lot of people have low levels of uh, chloride and sodium because they're over-retaining fluid. And this is sort of where you get in trouble with insulin resistance and an over-retention of fluid, you can drop chloride and sodium levels. Now, again, we, we sort of covered in the beginning that chloride is important for stomach acid. It forms hydrochloric acid. It forms hypochlorous acid, which is secreted by our immune cells to kill bacterial invaders. Um, and both sodium and chloride are extremely large predictors of bad negative outcomes if they're low on um, your blood test results. So it is important to and again, you're, you're losing a lot of chloride as well, not just sodium when you sweat. You also lose more chloride than sodium when you drink coffee. So as you're sipping your cup of coffee, um, you actually lose about, in four cups of coffee, you lose about a half a teaspoon of salt. And the loss in chloride is actually about 50% greater than sodium. And so you can really flush your system out of chloride if you're consuming caffeine, caffeine tablets, or coffee, or tea, stuff like that. That's interesting. So what about the, um, I know a lot of people have their preference for their, their sort of favorite, favorite salts that they use. Um, but I'm curious to know like a little bit more in some of these research studies. Um, did you notice when you were researching like along the way, the the variations in the actual quality of the salt that they were using? Like, did that, did you notice that that was like a key variable or a confounding factor at all? So I've never seen um, most studies, probably every single study typically just uses regular table salt. Um, but there are key differences. Pink rock salts do contain natural iodine and we don't just lose salt and sweat. We also lose other minerals, particularly iodine. 
So a lot of people who are constantly exercising and sweating out salt and iodine can actually be, develop hypothyroidism. And so you can start actually putting on weight and, you're, and people are, are like, what, man, I'm working out so much. Why do I feel so fatigued? And why am I actually starting to put on weight? If you keep sweating out iodine and you never replace it and you're just consuming table salt and you're, you don't have good iodine in your diet, that can cause your thyroid hormones to suffer because thyroid hormones are made up of iodine. So that's an important factor when selecting different types of salts. Interesting. So what about a little bit on, um, I know there's a, there's a few sort of nitric, I want to discuss like the role of nitric oxide because um, obviously that's critical for blood flow, athletic performance, getting a good muscle pump during the workout. Um, so do you want to just maybe discuss how sodium can influence that nitric oxide pathway? Sure. So there's an interplay between salt and potassium and potassium actually helps with nitric oxide and it helps us eliminate uh, if we get too much salt. So a lot of people, if they're having problems with salt, it's probably because they're not matching it with potassium. So what I, what I have found is a one-to-one -one match about four grams of sodium with four grams of potassium seems to be sort of like the magic number. Um, but you really probably don't want to be less than three grams of potassium in the diet unless you have like some sort of kidney issue and you have hyperkalemia. Um, so nitric oxide is part of the reason why people with insulin resistance have an increase in blood pressure with high salt diets because they don't have enough nitric oxide to dilate the arteries. If you produce nitric oxide well and normally when you have a normal salt diet, there's no issue with elevations in blood pressure. Interesting. So what about, um, are there any sort of strategies that people can put into place for those that are actually, that actually struggle to retain sodium? And I know there's like a certain percentage of the population that do struggle and they're the ones that might have issues with like um, adrenal fatigue or um, um, Addison's disease, things like that. But, are there any other strategies that somebody can implement to actually help their body retain salt? So, so th probably one of the biggest reasons why people who are on low carb diets um, have fatigue and, and don't perform well is there's not just a the two week flush out of salt. Glucose helps you absorb sodium. And when you, reduce your exogenous intake of glucose, you don't absorb sodium well. And that's why some people, even on a, after the transition period for a couple of weeks, constantly need more salt because they don't absorb it as well. And besides glucose, amino acids also help us absorb sodium, um, particularly glycine, which is in collagenous meats. So there is a bene potential benefit of if you're taking, if you feel like you're salt deficient and you're not getting enough sodium, uh, two grams of glycine with about two grams of sodium can help absorb the sodium better um, because the, you know, it helps bring sodium sort of into the body, similarly to how glucose works. So that, that's why I, I'm not on a particularly low carb diet, why I consume about 60 to 100 grams of of whole food carbohydrates because I feel better. And probably some of that has to do with me absorbing sodium better and, and retaining it better. Mm. Yeah. I'm very much aligned there. I definitely, um, you know, if I cut back my carbohydrate intake, I noticed that all the low salt symptoms seem to, you know, reappear. And that's why I think one of the best like pre-workout meals really is just like a, um, a low GI, like whole food, um, you know, potentially like brown rice, something like that with heaps of salt and some protein as well to get that amino acid shuttling into, into the cell. So um, yep. is there a little bit of um, interest in like, I guess, like how salt influences mitochondrial function? Because I know a lot of, um, you know, now they're linking heap, plenty of metabolic diseases back to the efficiency of our mitochondria. But is there any sort of link there at all? 
So every cell, its function will start going down if you become dehydrated. So um, simply cutting out your cell intake and leading to dehydration will reduce um, cellular function at every level, including the mitochondria. Um, and then in particular, because you get the magnesium flush, if you're not consuming enough salt, magnesium is important for mitochondria to function. It helps provide energy to, um, right? It's a cofactor in the uh, electron transport chain for you to produce ATP as well. So there's this balance of with salt, just like every other mineral, there's an optimal level. And for the, for the guidelines to just say you, everyone needs to be on a low amount of this essential mineral uh, can put everything else out of balance. And without getting too controversial in regards to like the guidelines themselves, um, did you want to maybe like discuss a little bit of how they were actually developed? Like where, where do they even stem from? So most of our dietary advice stems from back in 1977, where they created the dietary goals. There were six recommendations um, to eat a high carbohydrate diet, to reduce saturated fat, to reduce cholesterol, to reduce sodium, um, and to moderate sugar intake. And uh, I think this, I, I can't recall what the sixth recommendation was. It, it, it might have been um, to limit red meat intake. Um, and then those dietary goals, they were simply based on expert opinion. And so we need to understand that the Cochrane database um, for systematic reviews, where they basically gather up all the randomized controlled trials and do a meta-analysis, that's the, the best evidence that you can ever have. It, that wasn't even formed until I think 1993. So if we're getting all our dietary evidence, um, you know, almost 20 years prior to that, then you know that it's simply based on expert opinion. So that's where it stems from because those dietary goals got converted into the 1980 dietary guidelines. And most countries followed suit. When, when the United States came out with these dietary guidelines, they were updated every five years and typically were just grandfathered in with no real, um, let's say, Senate committees or evidence-based medicine to say, wait a second, where are these evident, where are these guidelines even coming from? What evidence are they based off of? And even now, most um, guidelines that recommend low salt diets are simply expert opinion. They're not based on um, systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. Yeah, I find that again. That's just it's fascinating how um, things, these trends and things like people just they follow what's presented to them. Um, so, what about um, I know that, and you're probably probably seen it in the wellness community at the moment. Um, the whole carnivore diet um, and like obviously carnivore diets primarily meat and clearly very high in protein as well. So how important is salt for, for th that caliber of um, people in particular? So I try to look at um, how we used to eat from an evolutionary perspective um, beyond just sort of what we can access today. So if you look at your typical carnivore diet, it's going to be muscle meat and organs, but it's going to lack the salty fluid like blood and interstitial fluid that we used to get with from the whole entire animal, right? So the Maasai, they will tap their cattle and drink blood mixed with milk. And if we, we sort of evolved um, in Northeast Africa in very hot climate conditions, and the reason sort of why we became human is because we were heat adapted and we could persist and hunt these animals that no other carnivores could because we could sweat and we were furless. So where other carnivores like lions, saber tooth tigers had to be in the shade, we could persist and hunt. When we would kill that whole animal, we would, we would re-ingest all the salty fluids. So if you're on a whole food diet, you've already dropped your natural evolutionary intake of salt because we would get it through fluids. Now, I don't know too many people who are drinking blood. So if you're not salting your food, you're sort of missing out on that evolutionary piece that a lot of people sort of forget that we used to get. Um, and not only that, we would follow animals to salt licks. So we would, we would always 
either if we were deficient in salt, we would go to those tracks or mineral clays that were high in salt, or we would just simply drink brackish water. And so salt does play an essential role because we're sort of missing that piece now in the diet. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Something, some, definitely something that I think, um, those that and particularly like for the, for the bodybuilders and guys, strength athletes, things like that, they really need to keep in mind, um, how much the, that high protein diet can actually, it can also like flush out the sodium as well. I can't remember for every gram of increase in protein, there's like a de- decrease in sodium. Um, yeah. So what about, so in, I want to keep it sort of centered around that whole athletic performance realm. Um, and sort of discuss how the salt can influence uh, fat loss. Apart, like without looking at the the influence on insulin sensitivity, are there any other? Like, is it does it affect thermogenesis? Does it have any other effects elsewhere to influence uh, fat loss at all? So, if you look at it from the perspective of salt boosting performance and allowing you to exercise longer, then it obviously you are going to be able to put on more muscle or exercise at a higher level because of the salt you're ingesting. And so through that mechanism, um, if you're able to perform better and build more muscle, then you're going to automatically lose more fat through that mechanism. I don't, I don't know of any other mechanisms where salt is like thermogenic or, um, you know, increases brown fat or anything like that. Um, but from a performance standpoint, it's by far and away, the best performance enhancer, um, like 20 times better than your, your best supplement performance enhancer. That's awesome. I love that. Um, all right. Well, we've pretty much wrapped up today's episode. I want to keep it short and sweet. Um, cause I wanted a short and salty, sorry. Um, <laughs> just for our listeners. So, um, James, where can people learn more about you and, and your books and all of your awesome research? So uh, they could go to my website, which is drjamesdenek.com or on Instagram or Twitter at drjamesdenek. Awesome. Did you have any other um, maybe like final thoughts on sort of maybe like where the, where the research is heading towards or potentially is lacking in regards to, so I just thought of that one just then. Yeah. So the research is lacking in the sense that in order to really resolve this issue, Um, we need to sort of give the exact same diet to people and we have to match just for salt intake. Any of the studies that have ever shown a negative effect of salt have typically given sort of more fruits and vegetables, less processed meat, and it just happens to be lower in salt, but they've never tested out and given the exact same diets with the only difference being the salt intake. Once they do that, then we'll truly know what's a better intake of salt, a normal, a low, a high. But all the evidence so far is that a normal salt diet is much better than a low salt diet. And that getting more salt is better than not getting enough because it's an essential mineral and you can't produce it. Whereas if you just get too much, your kidneys will kick out whatever salt you don't need. Awesome. All righty, guys. Well, thank you for listening in. I hope you um, gathered plenty of useful information. I knew this was going to be jam-packed with some golden nuggets. Um, And yeah, I hope you guys um, get a chance to check out James's work. Definitely hit him up on Instagram as well. He's got some awesome content there as well. Um, So yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show, James. I really, uh, really appreciated you having, having you here. Thanks for having me, Lucas. Thanks, James. Thank you, everyone, for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.